Greetings, I'm John Spear, and I've got a lot of items I need to redistribute using Applied Energy 62, and welcome to New Omni Factory Super Shorts. And a lot of storage buses to place in areas that I don't know if I'll be able to fit them in, but we'll find out. Oh, everything is going to need to change, it's going to be great. Anyway, our goal today, hopefully with better audio quality, is to set up Applied Energy 62 as a central item distribution, but not auto-crafting network and then use it to passively craft crystals from actually additions. I have made so many robot arms and electric pistons just in case I run out of interfaces, but I find it highly unlikely that I will in the near future. However, you can never be too sure. Actually, you can. We'll probably also make a better cobble works. We are first going to hook up our major item resources to the network, because as we take things down from the Android bus, they still need access to these crucial items, so I want to have these items already in. I'm going to start with, like, seven storage buses, because I think that's about how many I need for all the different drawer systems in my area, but that'll probably increase over time. We'll see. My Android buses just get thicker and thicker over time. Okay, right now it turns out this pattern terminal will let me take items in and out, so this will be the way I test. Let's see if I remove 6410 and put it back in. Cool, I still have 31,188. Yes, everything seems to be working. We'll chest transport this wrought iron up here, so that I can fit this drawer controller with a storage bus. And we're going to partition these storage buses based on the items that are currently stored. That way we don't get random items going into our network. So I'm going to press this button. Right now it looks like not everything fits, so I'm going to add capacity cards in order to make sure this actually works. I don't precisely want to waste my capacity cards, but I only need one to fill up this storage bus, or to fill it up with all these items. So that should be good. We'll partition this storage bus similarly. Instead of having this extremely tall pile of storage drawers, we will supply things using interfaces instead, so let me just destroy all these drawers. We must be very careful never to accidentally connect a sub-network to our main network, because item distribution could get messy if I have just random things that are allowing any items in whatsoever. So in order to connect this interface carefully, I am attaching it first to an ME conduit and then disconnecting it from adjacent ME conduits, and then finally attaching it to this main network. And I must be very careful not to accidentally attach other ME conduits to this interface, um, which could easily happen, so... <laughs> I apologize for the significant number of vocal plosives in this episode compared to previous episodes. My, my microphone, for some reason, is not picking up as much volume as it should be, and so I have to put it close to my face since it was collecting more of those breaths. I will try to correct this as soon as possible, but I really have no idea what's going on. I'll filter this interface on iron, and now the system should be restored. Then let's check what we need in order to run the alloy smelters. I have access to the wrought iron, the silver and the gold, and the redstone and iron and tin that I need in order to run most of these alloy smelters, but I still need to get access to silicon dust and steel, and I also need to get access to coal dust. So I'm going to replace this old um, carbon drawer with a carbon and coal dust drawer and lock it. And set this to extract on blue, remove some coal dust from it, and place it into here, and then get out some and put it into the filter, and it should start flowing into here perfect. And I know that sounds bad. We're going to have a modularized section for passive things like that very soon. It should be a sub-network as well, of course. This is definitely a temporary fix, as I have had to remove the void upgrade from this drawer, although it originally was on here. Obviously, I meant to void excess carbon, and I'm pulling it from somewhere. I don't really know where. Anyway, let's slap a storage bus on this baby, and then partition it. You have to make sure you use this kind of cable to do it, although it doesn't cause lag to switch between Ender.io and ME conduits. And then we will partition storage. Because space issues, it will eventually be fixed when the holy bus goes away altogether. Let's slap a storage bus here, and then again partition it the way I ought to. Wrench this and separate it from the main network. That does mean my endstone creator will currently be broken, but I'm literally not using it for anything right now anyway. We'll put an interface underneath and hook it up with a conduit. For safety, I've set all my inputs to these machines for purple as my special Applied Energy 62 item distribution method just for now. And supply tin, iron, gold redstone, wrought iron, silver, and silicon and coal dust. Now we are currently about to be full on coal dust, so let's see what happens if I try to put a single coal dust in the network. It will not go. Perfect. That's fine. I don't want things to go anywhere if they don't have anywhere to go, which may or may not be an absurd thing to say, but I'm just going to put the coal dust into this furnace so that it can be used for something as opposed to me throwing it out into the void. I also want to supply aluminium and red alloy to the network, but I don't want to set up a particular storage bus just for these two items. I think that would be a bit silly. However, if I now and continually forever extract red alloy from and aluminium from these two blast furnaces, I might have a problem. 
I might just be voiding a lot of important redstone and copper, for example. I mean, I can never have enough aluminium, but like, still. The point is, instead of pulling red alloy and aluminium into compacting drawers, I want to pull them directly into the Applied Energistics 2 system from their output buses. I'm going to hook those two compacting drawers onto this compacting drawer system. And I'm going to level emit the red alloy blast furnace when there's too much red alloy in the system. Step 1, let's transport our compacting drawers all the way over to the system near here. And then lock them and get them into the partitioning. I'll need another capacity card. Step 2, extract from these output buses using the purple line, which is currently separated from the main network, into this interface. Let's get that in now. They are now empty. And the interface is empty, and let us check if this pattern terminal has... Well, I mean, I'm, yeah, so it should still have the red alloy that's in these compacting drawers. To confirm, this just went from 8,888 to 8,889. If you're confused, recall that interfaces allow you not only to supply items from a general Applied Energistics 2 network, but import them directly into any available storage spaces for those items. In keeping with the whole no more holy bus thing, since all of these items are already supplied to me by my general network, I will unhook the input here entirely. Amazingly, I only need to supply aluminium dust, silicon dust, and copper. And then, since I still need these two outputs to output to the whole network, I'm going to set this interface to insert as well. As long as self-feed is disabled, the interface will never try to extract out of itself and put things back into itself at the same time. That would be silly. One problem, I am currently extracting gallium on purple into these blast furnaces, so I just need to remove it and put it onto my general dust system. Make sure to regularly repartition, folks. Now I can supply gallium, and I'll put this extra gallium here so it gets returned. And then I very poorly rerouted my conduits. And now, with further wire shenaniganry, I'm going to ha I now have space to level emit each of these controllers. I'll show you how to put a machine controller on, a on the front face of a machine in a moment. You can't put a machine controller on the front of a machine, but you can turn it to the side without breaking the blast furnace, put it on the front, and then, okay, well, you will break the blast furnace, and then shift-click the front back to the front of the machine. Again, shift-right-click, place, shift-right-click. Now we'll place aluminium into this level emitter. I'm about to have 144 stacks of aluminium ingots, and I think that's about when I'm going to stop, over 9,000. Same for red alloy ingots, which I'm also about to cross the 9,000 line on. So let's set this to 9,001. Same for this one. And now this blast furnace has its working disabled after hours and hours and hours of running, and this blast furnace is still going to run for a bit. To adjust these systems, we're going to need two things. We're going to need to supply um, the items that we were already supplying using an interface rather than a chest, but we're also still going to need a chest to store extra items using a storage bus. What I'm going to do is to have a stack of interfaces up this way for the right system, and a stack of interfaces up this way for the left system, and use the middle space as a chest which will be shared storage for both systems. I've gotten a little janky with the ME conduits that I'm going to connect to the interfaces. They're not connecting to any of the sub-networks, but they will be connected to the main network. I'm going to partition this storage on the three types of ingots, but I'm going to remove the rods. And then I'll partition this storage bus, but remove all of these items. And now this chest is partitioned on one side for the rods, and the other side for the wires. In order to jankily storage bus these rods, I've attached to this storage bus here. Remember, storage buses don't work with ME conduits, so I can't disconnect an ME conduit from this interface. But I can use a quartz fiber to separate this glass cable from this interface. So this glass cable, which connects to the main network, does not connect to this sub-network on accident. The quartz fiber doesn't transmit the network. We'll do the same thing here, but we actually need two quartz fibers in order to prevent this cable from connecting. And then interface. Now we should see in our network even numbers of the wires, and not the extra wires that we would see if this storage bus was also connected to the network, and we do see those even numbers. In order to supply annealed copper to the network, I also need to attach the annealed copper for my blast furnaces. Thankfully, I've just hooked up a compacting drawer with annealed copper that I'll pour everything into. If I'm right, disconnecting this output, setting it to purple, and then hooking it up to this system should suffice to get the annealed copper into the major network. And in fact, it's working. Ah, Applied Energy 6 2, it's awesome! Anyway, I'll just do the same thing I did over here. Over here, I'm going to set up an interface that supplies all of these blocks, and then I'm going to set up a chest that will have all the, the extra plate storage, and then make sure it's all jankily storage bust up. It's fine, everything's okay. 
Just so you know, you could also use the cheaper cable anchors in order to separate systems from each other, but I already had quartz fibers and they were more readily available than steel bolts, so I just use those. Alright, as of right now, we have most of the items and drawers on our base hooked up to the A network and still available to the rest of our Ender IO network, which means I can conceal them all again to save my FPS and I will still be able to access everything from my Applied Energistics terminal, which was one of the main reasons I did this. It's now time to use formation planes to quickly automate the atomic reconstructor. Acceleration cards drastically increase the speed that a crystal growth chamber creates to quartz. You may recall that the atomic reconstructor has two modes. It will either pulse every time you give it redstone, or it will deactivate when it has a redstone signal, and otherwise fire constantly. Every time it shoots, it uses up 1000 RF. That is not really a problem for us thanks to this incredible system. So if I wanted to, I could automate this by just leaving it on deactivation mode, never deactivating it, have it shoot constantly, and then just throw items in front of it and have them transform whenever I need them to. If you need it to go extremely fast, turning it on repeatedly actually works faster than just deactivating or reactivating it and letting it pulse on a regular basis. Many people will put a pressure plate down in front of the atomic reconstructor and put the atomic reconstructor on deactivation mode. And then they'll use a knot gate so that when items are on the pressure plate, the redstone turns off and the atomic reconstructor turns on. Or you can hook up a timer to a redstone signal and use an AND gate so that when items are on the pressure plate and the timer is ticking, it will make the atomic reconstructor fire. So you can make the atomic reconstructor fire much faster than a deactivation mode. This is useful after you get the tank when you need to make oodles and oodles of items. I was considering using a level limiter with a crafting card because a level limiter can turn on or off whenever an item is crafting. The problem is I want to craft several different items with the Atomic Reconstructor and the level emitter will only accept one type. So instead what I'm going to do is actually allow the Atomic Reconstructor to run constantly. It seems to run every 5 seconds, which means it'll use roughly 10 RF per tick, which is completely negligible. It doesn't seem to be making sounds, and I don't exactly know why, but if it were making sounds, I could use something called the Super Sound Muffler as a bauble, stick it in my inventory, and it'll muffle that sound. You can choose which sounds you want to muffle. Right now, I have a formation plane, a wooden pressure plate, a block that's connected to a redstone conduit, and the atomic reconstructor on, oh, it's currently on pulse mode, but I'll switch it to deactivation mode momentarily, after I create a redstone knot filter. With this knot filter inside a redstone conduit, this redstone will turn on even though there's nothing on the pressure plate, but once I put the pressure plate on, it looks like the redstone turns off. Let's try throwing this torch onto the pressure plate and see if the atomic reconstructor runs. Eventually. Yes, there we go. So now, if any item were to fall into the pressure plate, the atomic reconstructor would eventually run. Now we'll make a range collector, which I can filter to automatically pick up specific items. In particular, I filtered it for Restonia crystals and void crystals. Excuse me, I've actually moved it to the corner because a wooden pressure plate will actually turn it off. A formation plane set to item will drop items into the world. If it finds any redstone or coal in the network that it's attached to, it will just drop them immediately. We're going to put crafting patterns into this ME interface to turn redstone into Restonia. When Restonia is requested, the redstone will enter the chest, and then it will become part of this tiny subnet. The formation plane will throw all the redstone into the chest onto the pressure plate. Additionally, this small network will be supplied with power by this quartz fiber, which will transfer power from this network to this one. In order to prove to the network that we have in fact gotten the items, we're going to extract them from this range collector and put them into this interface. And then we're going to storage bus those items onto a set of drawers, which will also storage bus to the major network. The main network will be storage bust to this drawer controller with void crystals and restonia, while this interface hooked up to the main network will supply redstone and coal. The crafting sub-network will be storage bust on both the interface to supply redstone and coal to the system, and the drawer controller in order to have a space to put the void crystal and restonia crystals when they get input into this interface. Unfortunately, power will not transfer from the main network to the subnetwork by placing a storage bus on the interface, but I can use quartz fibers for that purpose. And with this quartz fiber added, these devices are now online, and we should expect the formation plate to be online as well because of this quartz fiber. Yay! Alright, we've hit a hiccup. How are we going to use this system to passively stock Restonia and Void Crystals? We could put a crafting card in an interface and have it automatically 
supply Restonian Void Crystals, and then we could take items out of that interface and put them into these drawers. However, because these drawers are connected to the subnetwork, the subnetwork would pull the items out of the drawers and resupply them to the interface, resulting in an infinite loop where you pull items out of the interface, put them into the drawers, and the network pulls the items out of the drawers and puts them back into the interface. So this is not a good idea. So it looks like our solution is going to be to remove this storage bus so that it's not connected to the main network. And then we'll have an interface with a crafting card supplying Restonian Void Crystals automatically, and we'll have an Ender IO item conduit pulling out of the ME interface and putting into these drawers, which are partitioned for coal and redstone. Void and Restonia, excuse me. Then we'll put down a 1k crafting storage. Hiccup number 2 and 3. Just putting a redstone into a chest with a storage bus is not sufficient for the formation plane to decide that it should throw it into the ground. However, putting an import bus onto the chest will work. But the third hiccup was that it will not put items into the world if there's a pressure plate in the block that it's trying to summon them in. For some reason, just inputting Restonia crystals into this ME interface is insufficient for the Restonia crystals to go to this ME interface. So I have decided to storage bus this chest as extra storage, specifically for things like the Restonia crystals. They won't be pulled out because this formation plane is, um, is partitioned only on the specific redstone item. It's also worth noting that for some reason, this ME conduit acted like it was connected to the store controller with a storage bus because items kept getting put into the store and then removed from it and put back into this ME interface and then removed and put into the drawer and put in this interface in a cycle, which was annoying. I had to remove everything from the block and put it all back in in order for it to work. Now I'll set a pattern to turn 32 redstone into 32 Restonia crystal and I'll place it into this interface. If you put acceleration cards into the import bus, it will import faster into the formation plane. The system is now running on a regular basis, redstone is falling onto the pressure plate and filling up the interface, and then all that is getting extracted into the basic drawer. When the basic drawer finally fills up, then this interface will fill up as well. This chest might get a few extra Restonia crystals, and everything in the world will be happy. I have now also added void crystals as a pattern. And coal is working. So this was an absolute mess of a system. But it is expandable, not that there are that many things we will ever automate in the Atomic Reconstructor. Anyway, this episode has gone long. I was going to set up a cobble works, but I think I'm going to do that in the next episode, along with a system for passively auto-crafting things, which might take on a similar look to this, although I don't know, it might be bad. We'll see. For now, that's it for today's episode. As always, if you have any feedback, I'd love to hear it. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll be able to fix the audio system soon, and God bless you all.